Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this um, webinar. This is the big picture in math, four concepts the books need to teach. This is hosted today by Lynx. If you're unfamiliar with Lynx, please do visit our website. It's lynx.ed.gov. Um, Lynx is a U.S. Department of Education sponsored um, adult education resource. So we have all kinds of things such as curriculums, um, resources, professionally moderated discussion, um, and a number of different activities such as this one that you would be able to get plugged into. So I do encourage you to check that out. Um, this one, will, after the webinar today, we will be continuing our discussion in the math and numeracy community. Okay. And today um, I'm going to turn it over to Brooke Istas, who is the the moderator of that group. She will introduce our speaker today and a little say a little bit more about um, the discussion that will follow. Hello everybody, my name is Brooke Istis, and as Megan said, I am the moderator for the Math and Numeracy group. Um, I would like to thank Dorothea for taking part in this um, webinar today. As you can read, you know, Dorothea has over 10 years experience tutoring and teaching adults in math, both from high school equivalency test and as a community college developmental level math instructor at Front Range Community College. Um, she is also uh, has a great article um, on the focus on basics from the 2008 article using part whole thinking, and it is listed as a links resource in the resource collection. And she currently holds the Colorado Adult Basic Education Authorization and previously held a K-12 teaching uh, credential in New Mexico and Illinois. I also know Dorothea and she is a member of the Adult Numeracy Network and she is a wonderful knowledgeable friend of mine. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her and please post your questions into the chat as you come across them and there'll be time for you to answer or get your answers. If you do not get your questions answered today. I want, I'm going to be posting a link to the links discussion for math and numeracy so you can also pop on there and uh, you can she will be available for the next two to three days to kind of answer your questions as they arise. So Dorothea without further ado I'll hand it to you. Thanks Brooke and thanks links for giving me the opportunity to do this. I'm going to start by making some statements, and I've, they're written here for you to see. And the first is that adult math books assume certain understandings by students, even at the lowest level. However, concepts introduced early in elementary school may not be presented in enough detail for people who did not get the concepts in the early grades. That's what this session is about. This session addresses four of those missing concepts. To get started today, I'll do the same thing I do with a face-to-face -face class, getting to know the names of the people. Almost the first thing we teachers do in class is to take attendance. When I do that, I say the person's name and ask if they prefer to be called another name or a nickname. For example, I'm Dorothea, but my family calls me Dee. My husband's name is Robert and everyone calls him Bob. My niece is Christine and she's always Chris. Now watch. What did I write and why did I write it? Briefly, send a note to the chat board to answer those two questions. We'll give it about 30 seconds so we get some answers in. What did I write and why did I write it? So you're not gonna hear sound for a few seconds here. All right, are we, I'm not seeing any of the answers. Brooke, are we getting some answers back? 
Yes, we are. Um, so we have, there's a lot of them actually. Um, they say equal two ways of writing the same idea. Um, they are the same. You wrote the full name of the student and what they wish to be called. Um, you let the nickname stand for the full name using the equal to mean equivalence. You wrote equivalence was another one. Right, um, right. So many of you who are attending this webinar got the point. And some of the students I've taught get the point as well. I can write an equal sign between the name and nickname because they mean, whoops, a different name for the same person. And this is an unusual way of presenting it, but there's a reason, I'll get into that later. If you think about different names, same person, the same idea is true for numbers. Seven can be the entire amount of apples inside the circle, or the apples can be re rearranged as smaller groups of apples with an addition sign between the numbers. These are the same amount as the entire seven, so it's different name, same amount. This is a new idea to many students, that equals means different name, same amount. And this understanding of equals is critical to understanding fractions and algebra and beyond. Why do we need to reteach this concept? It goes back to second grade or earlier, when children first learned the equal sign. Here's how second graders think about colors. They can see that blue mixed with yellow turns into green. Now they see the green and only the green. The blue and yellow have disappeared. They no longer exist for a second grader. A second grader applies that same kind of thinking to math facts. Seven plus five turns into 12. The child treats the equals sign as an action, and that understanding of equals remains with the child into adulthood unless and until someone challenges that thinking, like using an equal sign between the different names for the same person. So it's necessary to make adult students aware that the four basic operations are action symbols. They say either put these amounts together or take this amount apart. These action symbols are contrasted with the equal sign as a relationship. Although they look different, the relationship between the expressions on each side of the equal sign is that they are the same amount. To link that correct understanding of equals to a personal meaning, think back to the names and nicknames slide you saw just a few minutes ago. The relationship symbol shows which numbers have the same kind of relationship as all the names a person is known by. Different name, same person. Different name, same amount. To reinforce this idea, try this exercise. Ask your students to make a total of eight with an addition sign and at least three whole numbers. They may not use zero, and they can use the same number more than once. I have put a page with this the actual exercise for this and some other documents on a Google Doc, and you'll have the link for that when you go to the the links discussion section for this in, um, for this webinar. So an, another way to reinforce what the equal sign means is a brief formative assessment that asks only yes or no for the answer. Are the expressions on each side of the equals sign the same? Is the statement true? By the way, all the responses on this slide 
are, yes, they're all true. I fake them out with that 22 equals 44 times a half. They don't know what to do with fractions, and they're sure something up there has to be no. But these two activities offer a good opportunity to have students work in pairs so they can discuss each other's responses while you observe and listen. Do your students now have the correct idea of the equal sign, or do you need more activities to reinforce the concept? And remember to give students a night to sleep on the idea before you expect it to stick. Remember, math represents a physical reality. We learn new ideas by moving from concrete, something we have a physical experience of, to a representation of that experience, to an abstract idea based on that experience. We help students relearn an early concept by going back to a familiar physical experience. These are the four concepts students need to understand. We've already covered the meaning of the equals sign as different names, same amount. I'll give a very brief background about the next two concepts before showing why they need to be taught. And for the properties of one, we'll just have time to an introduction to how important those are to understanding equivalent fraction relationships. For right now, uh, Brooke, are there some questions that people have had on what I've said so far about the equal sign? No, ma'am. Okay. There is a research paper out of UCLA that's listed in the research background. And I've, I've put a, the, the research background citations into that Google Doc area too that you'll be able to get to. Also, when you're talking, if you need more background on the part whole relationship and why equal spaces on a number line is important, um, that links presentation that I did two years ago is a place to start. It's also in that 2008 article that Brooke mentioned. So going on, here's the background for the next concepts. Dr. Les Steffi and Dr. Paul Cobb, who's now at Vanderbilt, but both were at University of Georgia when they did this, they developed a three stages model of children's growth in understanding number relationships. These same three stages of number sense apply to adults. Stage one thinkers lack a sense of any specific size relationship between the whole numbers. Numbers to them are a collection of items like the names of fruit or animals. Stage two thinkers understand that the numbers increase by one, the same sized Oh, we lost sound. Dorothea, we lost. Yes, I didn't do anything and it just went mute on me. Sorry about that. I can hear you. Okay, I'm back again? Yes, ma'am. Okay, anyway, the, the counting numbers increase by the same sized one as you count them for stage two. And it's that same sized one that's the difference between stage one and stage two. So here's a visual representation of the understandings. For stage one, everything's just in a glump. There is not an organization to the number, no constant size or location. Stage two, the spaces between the whole numbers on the number line are all the same size. Look where the red arrows are. The spaces are all the same size. That's what stage one is missing. So moving from stage one to stage two, I'm going to ask you to participate in a physical example of helping a stage one student experience that equal distance concept. In the handout packet that will be, you'll be able to get to on Google, Google Docs, you'll see a number line like this up to 16. This one is set up as an activity. And I encourage you to place your finger lightly on your computer screen on the zero. Careful if you've got long fingernails. Listen for a steady beat, 
watch the spaces as they are marked and trace the spaces with your finger to match each beat. Get, set, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. And of course, the numbers go on. Why do this? Stage one students see the numbers on the number line or the vertical marks. They do not pay attention to the equal spaces between the numbers. And this hearing, seeing, touching, physical exercise makes them aware of the spaces in all three ways we humans experience the world. Physical experience first, concept understanding later. Here's one place that not seeing the spaces shows up. When using the coordinate grid, stage one students will likely count the lines when finding the distance from negative two to positive three. They count the objects and see six lines and they get the wrong answer. Tracing the spaces first helps them recognize that they must count the distance, the spaces between the lines. They move towards stage two understanding of number relationships. They can find the correct answer. And by experiencing equal sized spaces, they move on to understanding equal sized groups, the basis for multiplication. Now for the concept between stage two and stage three. Oh, and by the way, I think I forgot to mention that if you have a class of about 20 students, three of them, if they don't have their high school diplomas, three of them are likely to be at stage one based on research I've done. So what's the concept between stage two and stage three? For stage two, either the parts of a number exist or the whole amount exists. For stage three, both the parts and the whole exist at the same time. And this is the understanding you need to be successful in math. Here's a visual representation of those two different understandings. For stage two, three and six put together turn into nine. The three and six no longer exist. They have either parts or whole. For stage three, the three and six exist within and at the same time as the nine. Remember that second grade thinking, because of lack of brain maturity, there has to be a certain growth of certain brain cells before people can keep two things in mind at the same time. And the second graders, their attitude was when I combine blue and yellow, I have only the green. Stage two thinks seven and five turn into 12. The seven and five go away. That's research I mentioned earlier that I had done with workforce students working toward a high school equivalency. 75% out of 84 were at stage two. So contract this, contrast this either or thinking with stage three. When I combine blue and yellow, I see green, but I know that the blue and yellow are inside the green. In the same way, seven plus five is equal to 12 because 12 contains seven and five. Um, there are likely to be some questions at this point. Brooke, are we getting some questions about the differences in the stages or something that I've said? Actually, no, there's just one comment that said that your three of 20 is consistent with a, a person's experience with their pre-algebra placers as well. Okay, yeah, it's, it's amazing, it's consistent. Once you hit about seventh or eighth grade, I had done another study with a group of uh, students at an elementary mid school. 
And by the time the students hit seventh or eighth grade, it was like 10 to 12% were still at stage one. So I'll mention some other numbers a little later. Um, let's use a personal concrete experience to make students aware of the both and thinking they need to, to have. This takes more time in class than I'm going to give it here. Each of the questions on this slide would be on a separate slide in the classroom to give students time to think about an answer. Some slides have been combined here to save time. So the first question is, what parts of the face can't you see because of the costume? And you can just sort of think about this yourself. And in a classroom, you'd want uh, pairs of students to be able to think about this together. How do you know the parts are still there? The point being, we expect the nose and chin and so on to be there even when we can't see them. This is our experience. The parts still exist when they are hidden. So we do the same kind of a picture of a man sawing a wood. What parts of the body are not in the picture? And students will name some parts based on their own personal physical experience. Then the question is, are the parts missing or only out of sight? Again, the parts of the body and the whole body exist at the same time. From here, you want to move on to other familiar objects. And this is two slides. The first was, is it a whole quilt? Is it 100 pieces? And you would be surprised at the way students pause and think hard about which it is until you put up the next slide that says, or both at the same time. You need 20 seconds at least for students to consider each question before you go on with those. Dorothea? Yes. We have a question. Okay. Maybe a good, good one. To, um, it's how would you explain that 12 is seven and five, but it's also six and six and eight and four and et cetera. You just do it. That's why that exercise way back with how many ways can you make eight, the students get to do it themselves. If they start to understand the equal sign as different names, same amount, how many different ways can you come up with eight? It could be eight ones. Is that clear enough? It's, yeah, students, it's, and, and with that exercise with eight, it's a matter of using three numbers, at least three whole numbers and addition signs between them, not just the two number facts, but they have to come up with ways that they could make three numbers become eight. And they can repeat a digit. She said, thank you. Okay. So we're up to, um, talking about other examples that you could use if students are struggling with this quilt example, look around your classroom. Uh, there's probably a clock, there's certainly a table, a chair. So look at the chair, is it parts and whole at the same time? If a chair has no legs, is it still the whole chair? Do the legs or seat or back, the parts, disappear when you think about the whole chair? And so if students can get comfortable with this both at the same time with physical objects, then you're ready to move on. And the next thing I do is use an optical illusion and ask, which animal do you see? Think about that for a second. Which one did you see first? Most people see a duck with the beak to the right, or a rabbit with the nose to the left. I've had some people see a fish, but take time so students can see both images. The big question then is, did the lines on the page change when you saw the other animal? And the answer is no. Your mind changes what you see because your mind keeps both ideas at the same time just like the parts and the whole exist at the same time. 
And the point of all of this is with numbers, the parts and the whole exist at the same time. And that's what those stage two students, 75% of your people studying for high school equivalencies, that's what they are missing. Understanding that the parts and the whole are always there at the same time is the key to understanding math. Um, any more questions popping up, Brooke? No, ma'am. Okay. So when this parts and whole at the same time idea is new to students, you have to move slowly to show them how and why it works. I use simple examples with simple objects and pictures. I show part of a six pack of soda. What is the whole amount? What is the missing or hidden part? And I include that equal sign, that different name, same amount idea. Students are asked to write in the given part and the given whole, then to think about what the other part is. Some adult students get this wrong on the first try. They see four cans, they write four for the whole amount even though the words say six pack of soda. These are the students who may need some one-on-one -on -one help because one of the characteristics of, of stage one thinking is it has to be there. I have to see it in order to count the number. Other objects you might use as examples are a partly filled ice cube tray or egg carton or a sheet of stamps with some missing. Get creative. If some students struggle with this simple soda can example, they need many more examples till they get comfortable with this. Singapore math style books use a similar visual description of the parts and whole at the same time, part co whole coexistence. They use equal sized bars, but they may not include the equal sign. Singapore style books may be assuming that students think of the two bars as being equal. They may be assuming that students understand that the parts exist inside the whole because the bars are the same size. Most students in second grade and younger see two separate bars and only that. The brain development that's necessary to think about two things at the same time happens after age seven. And think about your younger second graders. They don't get to be after age seven until maybe the next school year. And this part, this introduction of thinking this way has already blown by them. So here's an experience that helps students represent part whole number relationships in addition and subtraction. It seems like a simple exercise. Draw the parts first, the red lines. Put the parts in line one after the other. Next, draw the whole. The whole is the same size as all the parts combined. Stage two and stage three students draw the lines as shown with the correct physical representation of the part whole relationship, that they're both there. Contrast state this stage two, stage three with what stage one does. The parts for stage one all start from zero. Stage one counts the lines or the numerals, not the distance from one number to the next. Then to get to the whole, stage one counts on fingers and draws a line for the total. And we're talking adults. There is no sense that the parts together are the same distance on the line as the whole. Correcting this, again, takes one-on-one -on -one attention from the instructor. It goes back to that understanding of the equal distance between the whole numbers, that they're all the same size. It's the difference between counting all, stage one, and counting on from, stage two, because stage two knows that five is always the same five once. Stage one doesn't know that. So you'll see this stage one behavior again, about 15% of students lacking the high school equivalency certificate. And I found stage one thinking in almost 10% of a group of over 300 community college developmental math students. These are people 
with a high school diploma in a remedial math class at a community college. It was almost 10% showed this type of thinking. So here's subtraction. Here's what stage three will do. This is the person who understands that the parts and whole exist at the same time. Draw the whole first. This is what you want to see. Then start from the whole and go backward to remove the parts counting the spaces, the distance, not the vertical lines, not the numerals. Stage one would count the lines and end up at the wrong place. When you do it correctly, the remaining distance from your numeral to zero is the other part. Here's what stage two will likely do with subtraction. Stage two draws the whole first. Then stage two draws the parts starting from zero, even when the directions say start from the whole. Notice the difference in the direction of the red arrows. Stage two is not using subtraction. Stage two is showing you an additive strategy to find the answer. Why? Because in second grade, this is how children were taught to subtract. I've seen math methods textbooks for math for pre-service teachers that instruct these new teachers to only use this additive way of, quote, subtraction with second graders. Second graders are taught this additive method because their second grade brains have not grown the connections that allow them to keep both parts and whole in mind at the same time. Again, that connection grows after age seven for most children. And you'll see stage two behavior on a number line subtraction problem with about 75% of students lacking that high school equivalency certificate. And I found this stage two thinking in an additional 10% of that group of over 300 community college developmental math students. Remember, those are the people with a high school diploma or GED. Why am I putting this big, big emphasis on recognizing that the parts are contained within the whole when you have the whole, because word problems are either find the part. I went to the gas station, got 33.50 worth of gas, paid with a $50 bill. My change is the other part. Or word problems are find the whole. The theater sold 485 adult tickets, 139 child tickets, how many people attended the theater that day. When you look, yes, Brooke, you, uh, can I, I do what, a questions? Can I do one more slide? Yes, ma'am. And then we'll do a pause. Okay. Um, I say, set it up this way because there are really only two kinds of math problems at the level of basic math or pre-algebra, what you're working with for people getting their HSE. Either the problems are find the whole or find the part. And the find the whole problems, you add or multiply. The find the part problems, you subtract or divide. In this approach to application problems, students look for the number relationships first. And those relationships, am I finding the part or the whole, tell which, oper which operation to use. And that's different from the five-step model the standard model, which says choose an operation. So students pick something and hope it's the right one. But this part whole approach to application problems needs an entire webinar, and I'm just going to pause here now. Go ahead, Brooke, with your questions. Okay, so we have one question that says, what kind of formative assessment can be used to identify which stage students are in? Oh, that's such a delightful question because I did the web the uh, discussion board on the number line assessment that I found identified the differences in students. If you look in the research background sheets, you'll see that links webinar from September 2016. And that's uh, with training. If you can't do it right away, you need about 100 examples of student, actual student number lines, which you can access from that webinar to start to understand the differences 
in the empty number line. All the students put those five whole numbers, I asked students to put five whole numbers on an empty number line between zero and 20. And how they place the numbers tells whether they're stage one, stage two, or stage three. There are some, and if there's a little, like medicine, there's a little bit of art to reading the, the responses. Some are very clear. And there are some that are not quite so clear. And that's what those percentages I gave to you before were some research with that number line. If students were, I don't know if they're stage two or stage three, we counted them as stage three in the research. So when I'm saying that 75% of your students in a GED class are gonna be stage two, that's, that's estimating on the low side out of like 300 students. Is that enough for that one? And, and another question? Yes, so we have another question that says, is counting up an additive strategy? Yes, it is. Okay. It is an additive strategy. Um, and it works, but students don't recognize parts inside of the whole so that when they get to division, because they've used addition, comfortable old addition, to find the answer to subtraction, they're still lacking that parts inside the whole, so division may not make sense. So you want to be, to be able to see the that you're actually removing from the whole going backwards. It's, it's a different way of getting them to think about subtraction, um, opening them up to, I've got to think about numbers in relationship, not just this turns into this to get the answer. All right? Yes, and will you be posting your, your slides as part of your research resource in the Google Docs. It is there already. All right, thank you. Okay, so we talked about how important this find the part, find the whole thinking is to understanding word problems and multi-step word problems are just separate them out. Each step is either find the part or find the whole. Okay. And the reason this part whole thinking is so important is that part whole coexistence is the basis for understanding fractions, which I'm sure your students just love. Students must understand that the eight pieces in the three eight are there at the same time as the whole one. And that a fraction compares what I care about, the parts I care about, to the entire number of pieces in the whole. Fractions compare parts to whole. And if students don't have this both at the same time understanding of part whole, they don't have a good grasp of fractions. When you're thinking about teaching this, you want to start with the properties of one. And just to review, the easy ones, a number divided by one, it answers original number, a number multiplied by one, the answer is the original number. And this is the biggie. When any number is divided by itself, the answer is one. How many of your students will tell you that m divided by m equals m rather than one? This M is a different name for a number you happen not to know yet. And of course, you can make a fraction of any number by giving it a denominator of one. So you've been teaching your basic math class or GED class. You've been reminding them about different name for same amount so that when they come to fractions, they can understand that seven over seven is a different name for one. And what is the rule about multiplying by one? The amount you have does not change. This is what students are missing in fraction relationships. Because the fraction looks different, they think it is a different amount teaching and stressing the properties of one and repeating aloud in class, everybody with you, different name, same amount, takes the mystery out of equivalent fractions. Students now understand the relationship. 
when they understand this use of one in fractions, students can expand the algebraic expression on the left by writing out the exponents as multiplications. They can see the ones, A over A, B over B, C over C. They factor out the ones and they understand why what is on one side of the equal sign is a different name, same amount, for what is on the other side. It goes back to understanding the parts and whole relationship in that fraction and the property of one multiplying, dividing by one. You're not changing the amount you have, just giving it a different name. To recap, the four concepts the books need to teach are the meaning of the equals sign as different name, same amount, the equal spaces on a number line, that is, all whole numbers are the same sized one apart, the part-whole relationship in problem solving. Word problems are either find the part or find the whole, and if they're multi-step problems, each step is find the part or find the whole. This is at least up through algebra. And the properties of one, especially a number over itself is one, to understand the relationships of equivalent fractions, to understand why they can factor fractions. That's what I've got for you today. Let me just go to the next two slides to show you the resources and references. Um, Stigler out in California had done a similar uh, a testing of students' understanding of the equal sign, community college developmental math students, and the same thing. They did not really understand that it meant different names, same amount. And then these are several of my publications, and that number sense, a third one, number sense, a simple tool that uncovers at that 2016 links presentation. Um, I'll be Yes, go ahead. This is it. I'm ready for questions. Yes, okay. so we have one comment that said our, that one of their teachers does a ton of examples with the N over N and N over one. Um, and it is so, and she emphasized, so helpful when they're taking pre-algebra. Exactly. But you have to go back to, under, to make sure they have that sense of parts and whole at the same time and end just getting that into their head that there are so many different ways to write one if they can find the ones they can factor things um, when i was in the classroom i would teach that last example about you know that humongous expression with all the exponents and i'd ask them i'd be writing on the board but i'd ask them to tell me how many a's do i write how many b's do i write let's find the ones and then i'd finish writing it this was the basic math developmental classes. And when we finished, and they understood that what that complicated first expression was equal to the simplified one. And I said, this is what you're going to be doing next class, the pre-algebra class, and you already understand it. And they were amazed that they already knew what was going on in pre-algebra. What a confidence booster. So uh, next question, we have time. Yep. If anybody has any questions, please post them. Are we getting some questions or should we go on and, and show where the survey is? I don't, uh, there's none being posted, so. Okay. Well, either I've done a really good job or it's so, or else it's so complicated, nobody can think of the questions at the moment. So <laughs> um, here's this link's disclaimer that some of this was funded by the U.S. Department of Education with the Manhattan Strategy Group who hosted this webinar today. And then there's a survey. And um, Megan, I think you maybe need to jump back in here. Okay, thank you so much, Dorothea. Um, please complete the survey that helps us so much to know what's um, helpful to our audience or what our audience wants to see for future webinars. I have posted the hyperlink in the discussion in the chat. 
So if that's more convenient for you, you can find that there. Um, and please join us for the discussion in the Math and Numeracy community this week. Dorothea and Brooke will be answering questions um, from the webinar and people can post new questions there and they will be there to respond. So we hope to talk to you then. Um, Dorothea or Brooke, anything else? Um, the name of the webinar for those of you um, that are asking, Dorothea, you want to tell them what it is so they can put it in the survey? The big picture in math. There you go. I think that should be that should be sufficient. The big picture in math. And then I posted the link to the discussion in the chat box. So um, if you are currently a member of Links, you can go sign in and go there. If you are not, then it's fairly easy to create a sign in, um, and it's free. And so that's where Dorothea will be posting her Google Docs information. So I encourage you to get on, get on and get involved in that discussion. Um, Thanks. Everybody. Somebody, there's one question real quick. It says, "Did you encounter any challenges when introducing this to your class?" Yes, there were challenges and resistance. Um, for people who are stage one, I would ask them to meet me and try to introduce them to what they didn't understand. But it's a case of I don't know what I don't know. This crazy woman is trying to make me do something that's just stupid. There were a few of the stage one students I met with one-on-one -on -one who realized that something was missing way back at the beginning. Um, it's, it's difficult for stage one to realize it. Stage two, it's a little simpler because they recognize that they're beyond the stage one and they get this sense that there's something I'm missing. Why, why is this so different? I, students have told me um, at the beginning of class, this is not like any math class I've been in before because I started with the different name, same amount, rather than, okay, here's place value, here's the names of the, the columns and place value, here's how to do addition, which they already knew. This is one of the problems with the um, developmental math classes at the community college. The books all follow the same script as the K-12 books. And students know it already and they turn off by introducing this different way of thinking. And I catch them by surprise with that equal sign right at the beginning when we're just doing names. That, um, and there, there are a few more things I do. But they, the ones who aren't willing to give me a chance with this, they will unfortunately leave after a couple sessions. But the ones that stick with it, they find that all of a sudden math makes sense to them thinking about parts and whole. Anything and else? Yes, yeah. there's another comment that says that they're quiet because they're thinking of how to integrate this and that I'm looking to make these four concepts a way of covering numeracy with multiple levels in the room. So Right, right. And what you do with the more advanced students, the ones who are stage three, for, who get this, like my engineering husband, it took me a couple years to convince him there really were people out there who didn't think like this about numbers. Uh, what you tell them is, you may already know this, but you may sometime have to help someone learn math who doesn't have these concepts. So you need to know how to explain it to them. That's my ploy for the people who already have the concepts. And that works quite well because then that puts them in the driver's seat. That puts them in control. They're being the teacher. Okay. And and one thing I would urge, you have to go with the speed of your class. If you have, if you discover suddenly that half your class is stage one, you will take a couple days, you know, separated time-wise with just that first concept of equal distance. It's not, it takes sometimes six weeks for a person to really feel the physicalness of the concept, to understand that physical relationship that is the basis for addition. Another comment said that this could be very helpful in ESL class and they appreciated the way you presented it. Thank you, because you can use any language. You can use on the on that number line assessment. If you go to that uh, 
discussion from two years ago, 2016. The number line can be done in any language. Anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that I'll have more questions coming at me. Yes, remember to post your questions to um, the links. And like I said, I posted that that link to the webinar comments where Dorothea will be posting her Google Docs information for you all. So be sure to complete the survey and get on the links. And is there anything else, Megan, before? I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Dorothea, for presenting. Oh, all right. Uh, and yep. there's a, there was a cut. OK. The, um, there's some extra questions coming in, so be sure to post those on to the links. I just want to cover that one more time. And then if you have problems getting on to links, if you can't post comments, uh, there is a help link on the website that you can get on and it'll help you sort out why you can't get logged in and everything. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.